graduation, uh, and some of you uh, may have uh, competing commitments. So thank you all for coming. It's my absolute pleasure to welcome back Sergeant Palmer Hilton White. Um, Hilton uh, received a PhD in anthropology from the University of Chicago. Um, he was later a Harper Schmidt assistant professor at the same institution, uh, and uh, assistant professor also at the New School of Social Research. Um, and most recently, since, since 2010, has been uh, at, in anthropology at the University of Bolivar. Um, he has also long been serving on the executive of anthropology of Southern Africa. Hilton's interests include critical theory, the anthropology of value, and the ethnography and history of social relations in the southeastern part of, south of Africa, in particular um, northern Kwazulu Natal, where he's conducted ethnographic research two decades, focusing on the way that people in rural communities make and think about social ties, especially in the context of households and families. This has led him to publish work, in, work on issues of kinship, the life course, architecture, ritual, customary law, and political authority. He is currently completing a book that examines how Zulu South Africans have navigated complex ethics of keeping up proper relations with ancestors in the post apartheid context far-reaching social and cultural change and profound economic insecurity. Indeed, added to these works, he's also published a very influential critique of the tour's reading of Marxist theory of the fetish. Hilton will speak today on the topic, how is, capital, how is capitalism racial, the non and critical theory, a talk which promises to think about the foundations of capital, to talk to the ways in which social types might be produced in capitalism, despite capital's processes of abstracting labor. This, I think, follows in, on in interesting ways from the talk that Sullivan gave last week about the paradox of the, the unseen and the overseen indig indigenous people in Brazil and the ongoing contemporary att attempts to draw them into the labor market. Just before I let Hilton start, I do want to take a, no a moment to note the passing of a former teacher of mine. Moish Bastone. Moish's project was really dedica dedicated and devoted to a rethinking of Marx for contemporary times, not by updating him so much as by reading him closely and asking what our times might reveal about Marx that has not been exhausted by traditional readings of him and traditional politics that came out of those readings. Hilton, Hilton um, knew Mo and Moish quite well, and I'm sure Hilton will attest to the fact that he was a truly transformative teacher dedicated to teaching in a way that was quite rare. Moish, of course, was also very interested in the question of racism and anti-Semitism in capitalist modernity that Hilton will address today. So with that, um, I welcome you. And uh, it's our format to, um, to, have four, to give you 45 to 50 minutes, and then for the floor to be open for 45 to 50 minutes. So please join me in welcoming Hilton White. Well, thank you very much. It's always so lovely to be here. Um, I especially know I'm in Stellenbosch this time because uh, the room I've been put in in a very beautiful guest house has no less than three portraits of Paul Kruger, uh, <laughs> including one above the bed next to a panic button. So I, I know exactly where I am in the context of South Africa, but, but, but a very lovely room it is as well. Uh, the extraordinary generosity and hospitality, so thank you very much. Um, this paper, uh, this is very sad, this paper is uh, explicitly not just influenced by, but about the work of Moshe Stone. And um, I was pretty much three quarters of the way through writing it when he passed away last week. So um, this is the first time, although Moshe has shaped uh, everything I've written in some way or another, it's the first time I've ever tried to write explicitly about a piece of his. And I was very much looking forward to sharing it with him, which I'm now no longer able to do. but. Uh, I hope that, uh, if anything, um, enough of him will come through in this that uh, people who don't know his work will take some interest in it and read it, because it is indeed profound and transformative, uh, both in reading and in, uh, and in his teaching. Um, so the paper is about uh, 20 pages, so it should fit well into the 45 to 50 minutes. Um, at the best of time, I'm a little slow on my feet when it comes to the discussion part of these kinds of uh, talks. It takes me a long time to think through things, so forgive me. If I seem vague, um, I also have a cold, which is what I was getting to. So uh, I'm, not, I'm not really on my feet, um, only apparently. Essence and appearance is very important. 
Okay, so uh, this talk is, I'm going to read from, uh, from, from the paper, um, but I wrote it more as a talk than as a paper, so hopefully it won't be too bad that I'm reading it. This talk is my attempt to address a tension, an apparent contradiction even, between two propositions. Both of them are deeply rooted in how we understand the nature and the problems of global modernity, especially in social theory. Either or both are in principle disputable, but I assume here that they're not in dispute, and that is therefore the problem of the correctness of them both that we must face. The first is one of our best known propositions about social change. While change might be intrinsic to historical process in all times and places, in the age of global modernity, even more so in late or hyper or post-modernity, change has a peculiar trajectory to it. It tends, however, unevenly towards the disassembling of all previously existing states of affairs, not to allow them to settle into new sets of fixed arrangements, but rather to set them loose in a dynamic of what seems like perpetual flux, renewed again and again. They vary in formulations of this process, but here I follow Marx, for whom it is a dynamic that originates in the organization of capitalism. Capitalism for Marx is a process of accumulation that operates through processes of, of abstraction. Unlike all other systems of accumulation we know, capitalism works by making its instruments commensurable to a single kind of value, the value which it accumulates as surplus. Put in economic terms, this is of course what we call the monetization or the commodification of wealth. But in order to commodify the forms of wealth, capitalism also has to reconstruct the sources of wealth to make them sources of value, value that's commensurable or fungible. In societies where capitalism predominates, more and more of life is thus remade over time to facilitate the abstraction of wealth so that it is available for inclusion in this process of accumulating value. Eventually, this tendency runs deep into the organization of every kind of activity to overcome both the stickiness and the slipperiness of concrete networks of people, things, affects, tools, designs, concepts. It's this tendency to abstraction that Marx indexed when he noted how in capitalist society, everything that was once solid turns into air. Or in Bauman's more recent resubstantiation of the metaphor, it's the wellspring for the liquidity of modernity. This also means that people themselves, as well as their relationships with one another, are subject to the same overarching dynamic of abstraction. In capitalist society, as Marx reminded us caustically in many places, there's very little in human affairs that sustains its own integrity on religious, moral, or other kinds of traditional grounds. The family, he often noted, while it's assigned a newly sanctified image as a refuge from a heartless world, in reality finds its roles and its relationships as subject as anything else to dissolution. That's the kind of tension I address in my own ethnographic work. And the same applies to religious faith and to other kinds of community, all up for grabs in a gyre of possibilities. The abstraction of human relationships has a very wide variety of social and political effects, of course, both emancipating and alienating. But what stands out is the overall consistency of the trend towards it. Most importantly for my purposes here, the result is that the notion of social identity itself becomes destabilized. In capitalist society, there is less and less in social life which affords the kind of solidity, depth, and consistency to personal being and social type that would seem to be essential to the concept of identity to begin with. As all that is solid melts into air, so do the ways we can know, name, enumerate who we are. Compare this though to the second proposition I want us to focus on. It's also one of our best known ideas about social life in the modern age. It also concerns a question about identity or identification. It goes like this. Beginning in the 15th century, with the origins and growth of what became the Atlantic economy, the modern world has been built around the growing solidification of racial identity as a fundamental vector of distinction, discrimination, exploitation, violence, oppression. No other kind of division has been so utterly inescapable, so utterly consequential in the making of global modernity. Certainly no other division has grounded so much systematic violence under a single sign over centuries. 
from the Middle Passage to the Belgian Congo onto the Nazi Holocaust. That last of which, as Hannah Arendt, Abe Cesare, and others have reminded us, can in certain lights, though not in others, be understood as the repatriation of genocidal racism to Europe. Granted, racial identities have changed over time and continue to do so, as do the criteria by which this or that population is gathered under them in particular historical conjunctions. But amidst this process of change, there is a very determinate pattern nonetheless. The simplification over time and the hardening over time of categories such as black, the progressive elimination of ambiguities and middle grounds, and therefore the growing salience of race as a basic category of identity. Versions of what we now call race and racism existed before the Atlantic age, but in no time have they ever been so essential to the constitution of the core of social and political life. And far from being an atavistic exception that slowly eroded, as Whiggish versions of modern history would have it, race in fact has deepened and widened its role over time in defining how we live and who we are in modern society. Clearly there's a difficulty presented here. What I want to argue is that the problem runs to the heart of how we understand what modern social life is. How do we hold these two ideas together? The dissolution of all identity, the hardening of race. One obvious answer is choosing not to do so, abandoning the one idea in favor of the other. Something like that choice seems to lie implicitly behind the kinds of mutual avoidance and non-debate that we see now between different camps of the North American humanities. But a little more than a moment's reflection would tell us that this is an act of bad faith. The power of each of these two ideas lies exactly in the capacity that they both have to illuminate what we know to be true of the form of life we inhabit. So what I want to do instead here is to sketch out just the beginnings of a proposal for how we could in fact think them together. And what is more, to think them together in a determinate, theoretically and historically grounded relationship with each other. My starting point is an inquiry into the concept of racial capitalism. This is a South African concept originally, at least as far as I know, although it has traveled abroad as well, especially in the work of Cedric Robinson on race and accumulation in the Atlantic world more broadly. What I find compelling in this concept is the sense that the development of race is not parallel to or extraneous to, but somehow in fact internal to the development of capitalism. In the South African case, Neville Alexander's work is the most compelling version of this insight. But there's also something I find unsatisfactory, or at least not yet complete, in the way this idea has been formulated and mobilized. This is that, in showing how race is intrinsic to the development of capitalist society, theories of racial capitalism usually subsume the dimension of capitalism under the rubric of class, and therefore treat the problem of racial capitalism as a problem of somehow relating race to class. This is where Pistone's influence is clear. As I will make clear, I think that this is an intellectual trap. But at any rate, and this is where Fanon comes in, because it is Fanon who gives us the most precise and incisive account of what modern racism is as an ideology. Racism, Fanon insists, is all about the body, or more precisely, the reduction of embodied subjectivity to an unintelligent animal biology a feral bodily potency that can only be incorporated socially if it is tamed, especially by the application of violence. I take this as our most adequate account of what race amounts to in modern ideology. Fanon himself, to go further with this, is very clear that he takes the economic relationships of slavery, colonialism, and capitalism to be the ultimate platform for the development of this kind of racist imagination. He treats racism as a historically grounded phenomenon, that is, not a trans-historical one. But he does not work out in detail how we could understand that grounding. So how could we close the circle? Holding full account of the specificity of race as a way of thinking about and acting on human subjects violently, while grounding that specificity in a determinate way 
in a general account of capitalist society. For a model of how to do that, I turn to Moish Bastone's work on the connection between anti-Semitism and the overall structure of capitalist social relations. Bastone shows us that the development of modern anti-Semitism is not just an example of irrational or atavistic prejudice. Anti-Semitism is especially closely fitted instead to the way in which the operation of capital appears in fetishistic form as a power of abstraction that denatures the natural order of things, violating the concrete world in order to control it from a position of invisible but all-encompassing power. Here we are back with our first proposition. But Stone takes this as reason for asserting not just the deepness of the relationship between capitalist development and the rise of anti-Semitism, and not just as the reason for taking seriously the specific ideological content of anti-Semitic thought, but also as grounds for insisting on the uniqueness of anti-Semitism as a modern species of hate. Is there, therefore, any way we could use his account to think through other varieties of racism, and especially the anti-black racism that also seems so intractable and deeply rooted in capitalist society? In the closing parts of my argument, I take us back to Zanon again, <coughs> to a passage in which he specifically juxtaposes and differentiates anti-black racism on the one hand and the content of anti-Semitism on the other. Although he does not say as much explicitly, it seems clear from his way of wording his account that he's interested in the way these two kinds of racism, anti-Semitism and anti-black racism, form a dialectical pair. What unites them is not their identity, but rather their polarity. Without rehearsing the argument in advance, the point I want to reach in the end is my response to what I take to be the incompleteness of the idea of racial capitalism. Through dialectical synthesis, that is, of insights from Fanon and from Pastone, and what I have to offer is really little more than that, the synthesis of already existing ideas, we are able to further develop our understanding of racial capitalism by showing how and why the ideological pair of anti-Semitism and anti-black racism find their political potency. And that is in their ability to offer symbols for the basic structure of capitalist social relationships. Following Bastogne, I take that basic structure not to be class, but rather the alienated structure of action itself under the domination of action by the dictate to generate value. The structure of alienation appears in a polarized pair of fetish forms as a division between the power of a denatured and abstract will that has no body on the one hand and the power of a concrete body on the other hand equated with biological force but lacking self-governing will. The ideological pair of anti-Semitism and anti-black racism give to modern thought the symbolic articulation of these fetish forms. That is why they are such recurrent and toxically violent figments of global modernity. That is how we can hold together in theory both the abstracting trajectory of capitalist development on the one hand and the utter, utterly intractable, the utter intractability of racial forms of identity on the other. And that, by the way, is a very long introduction which forms an unfortunate uh, proportion of the whole of the paper. First, then, racial capitalism. The phrasing is an attempt to give a proper name to the structures of South African society as they emerged in the 19th and especially the 20th century. The social life of the concept has unfolded mostly in left intellectual circles and in small political movements that have placed themselves to the left of the Congress Alliance. That placing is important because the idea of racial capitalism is in fact a double critique, not just a critique of the form of society it names, but also of the critique of that society that's been offered by Congress theorists, especially in the Communist Party. So while this is not the place for engaging the history of socialist theory in South Africa, let us remind ourselves briefly what the idea of racial capitalism was trying to do better than. It was trying to do better than the theory of colonialism of a special time. Colonialism that was special because internal, not imperial. That account of South African society assigned no less importance either to race or to capitalism, but somewhat paradoxically it held them together by keeping them apart. It held them together in theory, that is, by pulling them apart in time. 
in order to assign their political salience to different historical periods. Race was to be at issue first in the context of an anti-colonial struggle for national democracy. Capitalism could only be put at issue when that first stage of struggle was over. This way, which will be very familiar to all of us in this room, this way of arranging the problem was, of course, a response to a range of very deep political constraints, such as conforming to third internationalism, also explaining why a communist party should harness working class movements to a struggle that called perhaps for the redistribution of property, but not for the abolition of the property forms or the social relations of capitalism as such. But as much as it was guided by political expediencies, it had less to do with a realistic appraisal of the South African situation, where race, race had hardened and deepened over time exactly as a consequence of the development of capitalism. As critics from the left opposition insisted, this made it very hard to sustain the idea that opposing capital had to wait until racism was somehow otherwise defeated. And that insight was what motivated Neville Alexander and others to turn to an alternative formulation of the problem. In What is Ania One Nation, Alexander lays out why he thinks that racism is such a central feature of the development and sustenance of capitalist accumulation in what became the society of apartheid. Now, a cautionary note is necessary here. Alexander is the theorist most associated with the phrasing racial capitalism, both by convention and in most of his writing, but in this particular text, the one in which he works out these ideas at most length, he actually tries to replace the notion of race with that of color caste. His reasoning is that the mere fact of the existence of racism does not allow us to talk about race as if it were a reality, even if one, even if one, that is socially constructed. Even as social construct, he wants to deny the reality of race. But even so, he's forced by his, the terms of his own inquiry to acknowledge that the historical reality of racism does create a population divided into differentiated and unequal categories, which he then calls color castes rather than races, in order to signal his unwillingness to talk in the language of racism. As much as we might find sympathy with the impulse, and as much as it is true that one runs the danger of reproducing racial categories in a critique of the inequalities that they generate, there's ultimately, I think, very little in any daylight between the entities he calls color castes and the categories which a conventional constructivist account would label racial, without, of course, thereby granting anything more than historical reality to the phenomenon itself. So I stay here with the phrasing, he's known not color caste capitalism, but racial capitalism. As to why South African capitalism is racial, Alexander's argument is this. The prehistory of the development of capitalist modernity in the subcontinent the prehistory of that is a particular form of colonialism that constructed social relations of inequality under the guise of racial difference, his color castes. In the particular material conditions under which capital proper began to develop later, especially towards the end of the 19th century, accumulation under these conditions would not have been sustainable if the society had been remade in the ways that metropolitan Europe, especially England, had just been remade in that century. Despite the expertise required for mining work, the engine of the development of capital here, the accumulation of profit was only possible with a supply of very cheap labor. So the response of South African capital was to invoke what for Alexander is a pre-existing system of racial distinction in order to create a racially bifurcated working class. On the one hand, a white working class possessed both of skill and of relative privilege, the latter based above all on being paid a wage that guaranteed a quote-unquote civilized life. On the other hand, a black working class that was not one. Was not one because, at least in its origins, was not fully dispossessed of land as a means of production. It was dispossessed enough in order to force it into the labor market, but even the marginal sustenance of its households as autonomous producers in the labor reserves was a fact that meant it was possible to pay this population of workers less than the actual cost of its material reproduction as a class. At the same time, the racial basis of the system meant that every African family was equally subject to the dynamic, 
Despite the seeming autonomy of the territories, no African bourgeoisie was therefore emerging in the reserves, only those who were more or less dependent on migrant labor. What elsewhere appeared quite apparently as class was therefore in South Africa mediated very profoundly, necessarily, by race. The national bourgeoisie was largely, if not exclusively, white, and only by means of racial discrimination was it possible to constitute a form of proletarian labor that made capitalist accumulation feasible to begin with. Racism was the condition of possibility for capitalism in South Africa then. For Alexander, most famously, this meant that a non-racial capitalism was actually unthinkable in South Africa. If it were true, if Alexander's claim were true, this would clearly mean that the dominant strategy of national democratic revolution was an unrealistic path to liberation. But strategy aside, this was also the only thesis to date, theoretically, that seriously attempted to take cognizance of the intrinsic role of race in the development of capitalism in South Africa. Standing back, there are two questions that present themselves from this reading of Alexander. The first is his claim that the racial dimension of capitalism is based upon the contingencies of the South African historical example. The second is the basis for the argument of the appearance of class as race. Let me take them one by one. For a start then, the specificity of the South African case, it is surely no accident that South Africa would have generated the theory of racial capitalism. Nowhere else in the modern world has it been so very clearly the case that the racial distinction of black from white has facilitated the process of the accumulation of capital. But others have been inspired by the idea of racial capitalism to think about the accumulation of capital in other parts of the world. Cedric Robinson is the primary example I have in mind here. In Robinson's work, the theory of racial capitalism acquires a much more ambitious, wide-reaching salience. Inspired by his encounter with South African ideas about the relationship between racism and capitalism, Robinson has suggested that these open up into a global account, certainly an Atlantic one. He argues that this allows us to see an aspect of the development of capitalist modernity on a global scale, which traditional Marxist theory has largely ignored because of its emphasis on class. Class, that is, in the way that it was rendered in Marx and Engels' account of the English case. Taking the South African idea as his starting point, he shows how it helps us to organize an account of a tradition of black Marxism that runs both alongside and often in opposition to the dominant strands of Marxist thought. There is not space here to give flesh to the genealogy that Robinson identifies, but one thought in it is crucial. What he draws out from the work of people like Neville Alexander is the fact that while race has a lot to do with capitalism, might not be identical to class in the, way that, that in the way in which that concept is conventionally understood in Marxist thought. And that would imply that the theory of racial capitalism raises fundamental questions about the centrality of the category of class to our understanding of the operation of capitalism as such. Alexander does not appear to have questioned the nature or the importance of the idea of class in this way, but it does not seem surprising to me that the way his ideas have been taken up have had the effect of doing so. And that takes us then to the second question, how class appears as race. Harold Wolpe is, of course, the South African theorist who thought about this most carefully, and did so at much the same time as Alexander. Although he was a communist, Wolpe takes his distance from the official formulations of the theory of colonialism of a special type. It was a matter of deep interest to him that race and class appeared to coincide in the case of South Africa, and he did not accept the argument that these referred political action to different phases of the struggle against unfreedom and inequality. Wolpe is also the theorist, of course, who inspired Alexander's own account of the role of the labor reserves and the cheap labor that they facilitated in grounding the possibility of capitalist accumulation in what would otherwise have been hostile conditions for capitalism in South Africa. What is more of note for our purposes here is his effort to develop a Marxist account of the ways that class might be race. For Wolpe, this is a matter of taking seriously the Marxist idea that social reality operates not in a flat space, but at more or less deep or abstract 
and thus also at more or less superficial or concrete level. In Marx's thought, to emphasize the distinction of surface from depth is absolutely not a distinction between the false and the true, or the illusory and the true, although it might be the case that at the surface level, the forms which emerge from deeper levels do not appear in the same way as they are at those deeper levels of structure. In other words, in Marxist thought, appearance or representation is a mode of existence, a mode of translated reality, not a mode of somehow ungrounded untruth or illusion. This is too often forgotten when we think about the idea that something is described in Marxist thought as ideology, as if ideology simply means the false rather than the mode of appearance. In Wolpe's view, the distinction between the abstract and the concrete is essential to understanding the relationship between class and race in South Africa. Class, he suggests, is essential to the organization of capitalist production. Only through the existence of proletarian labor is capitalist accumulation possible, but that abstract structure must always necessarily be mediated into the organization of particular social formations, a formulation he obviously takes from Althusser. In the South African case, he argues, race is the concrete form in which class appears. If we hold in mind that, in Marxist thought, appearance is not illusion, but mediation into the concrete qualities of particular social realities, this argument seems to specify, theoretically, what Alexander might mean when he says that racism is the condition of possibility for the development of capitalism in South Africa. Racism, in other words, is the necessary condition for the appearance in the concrete social reality of the South African case of the abstract relation of capital to labor that is essential to the accumulation of value. Well, so far, so good, I hope. But what happens if we try to take both Robinson and Wolpe as legitimate extensions or elaborations of Alexander's thought? The first version of the problem is this. If race is the mode in which class appears in South Africa, why is it also the mode in which the operations of capitalism appear in a much wider variety of geohistorical settings, locations where race cannot simply be identified with class? What this points us to, I want to say, is a further issue. Nothing in Alexander's account gives us insight into why the specific dynamic of race is something which appears in that wide variety of settings precisely because he does not want to give credence to the reality of race, Alexander is also too quick, I think, to contain it in the particular realities of South Africa. He treats it as a product, that is, of elite manipulations of a pre-existing imaginary, in a context where that imaginary is particularly useful for something external to it, the accumulation of capital. But the mere fact that someone like Cedric Robinson is able to extend the idea of racial capitalism to so many more historical examples seems to suggest that there is something deeper at work. And I think that we should genuinely take heed of Robinson's argument that race is somehow related to the trajectory of capitalist accumulation itself, even where this does not simply correspond to the historical constitution of a primarily black working class as in South Africa. The example of the New World is particularly important here. As much as there are black workers in this context, the main way race and class have been articulated, especially in ideology, is rather through the idea that there is a problem in making black people into workers. Right from the beginning of emancipation, the problem facing capital in the Americas has been the problem of incorporating black people into the cycle of accumulation through proletarian labor. And black people have consistently been imagined in this context as the limit point of working class identity, not as its appearance, let alone as its apotheosis. <coughs> black people in the Americas have consistently been imagined in racist terms, not as a laboring class, but rather as a lazy class, idle because of their fecklessness, their recalcitrance, inability to control themselves, and so on. Now, what's striking about that is that much of the same is said, of course, about black subjects in South Africa, where black and working class appear synonymous. So something is clearly inadequate in the ideas that we've encountered so far. What is missing, I would argue, or at least to begin to account for what is missing, is an account of the ideological specificity, the particularity of anti-black racism. 
And here, as I said, I think Fanon is the theorist who gives us the most far-reaching account of the kind of thinking that anti-black racism concentrates. I draw here especially on what Fanon has to say in Black Skin, White Masks, his masterwork on racism in Europe and its colonies, both in Africa and in the New World. Fanon's most powerful insight is that in anti-black racist thinking, the black person is identified with, to use his phrase, the cycle of the biological. The black person is identified as a body, that is, not as having, or even less as using a body, but actually as being one, in the animal or feral sense of the term, as a body that is essentially biological in its nature, being driven by instincts which lie beneath a human world that's characterized by will and by intelligence. Bereft of will, this biological body is intrinsically unmastered, an important point. It is hypersexual, it is violent, it is a biological force that interrupts the functioning of stability in society. It thus inspires fear, and it can only be incorporated into ordinary social life if some kind of external mastery is exercised over its biological flourishing. Fanon's account strikes us immediately and intuitively with its analytical power. Whether in South Africa or in the New World, whether in Europe, or in fact anywhere in the context of global modernity, this is indeed the essence of anti-black racism. Across all of its modern iterations, in anti-black racism, the black person is identified with an unmastered animal potency, a biological power that is dangerous to civil society and in need of violent mastery in order to make its forces socially useful. This biological potency can take the form of disease, of sexual excess, of criminal violence, but in the end it is always the same. The black body is a feral force that threatens the very possibility of a viable social order. Is it possible then to develop the idea of racial capitalism in a way that would take account of the ubiquity of this ideological structure of anti-black racism at the same time as it holds to the specificity of its content, and at the same time as it holds to a general account of the development and the structure of the social relations of capitalism. That's the question I now want to try to tackle. This is the last third of the paper. My route into this is through Moish Bastone's account of the relationship between modern anti-Semitism and the social structure of capitalism. Bastone, as far as I know, is the only critical theorist who has tried to provide an account of a form of racism that takes account at once of the specificity of its ideological content and of its role as a representation of the general structure of capital. Perhaps it's not surprising that anti-Semitism would be the ideology in regards to which an account like this could develop. There are few events widely regarded as being so historically particular as the Holocaust which Nazi anti-Semitism precipitated. If Pistone is able to show how the specificity of anti-Semitic thought is at the same time somehow related to the generality of capitalist society, then he shows us something that no other theorist of racism and capitalism has accomplished. Pistone's approach is to show how central features of the discourse of anti-Semitism gain purchase politically by providing representations of the functioning of capital. Key here are at least three related features. The first is that anti-Semitism represents Jews as agents of extraordinary power. This in itself is remarkable. No other kind of racism treats its targets as the possessors of social control. The second is that anti-Semitism depicts this Jewish power as being invisible. It operates through conspiracy from a distance, from behind the scenes, by manipulating the interventions of misled concrete representatives. And the third is that this influence is unhealthy. Like a cancer or a disease, Jewish power corrupts the healthy body of the community, twisting and distorting its proper functioning in order to fulfill purposes that are foreign to its nature. In all these ways, according to Pistone's argument, the anti-Semitic imagery of Jewish power provides a potent symbol for the fetish form of capital. 
Not capitalism as such, that is, not as a totality of complex social relationships that sustain accumulation, but capital as a fetishized congelation, as the apparent power of money in particular. The power that money seemingly has to corrupt, to dissemble, to commensurate what should be kept apart, and above all to control from a distance. In this fetishized appearance, money is the body of the abstract, it's the one-sided body of the abstract dimensions of capital. And anti-Semitic imagery makes the Jew the body of money. Now, the stone is clear that European anti-Semitism has a long pre-capitalist history, especially a medieval one. It's precisely this prehistory that makes possible the symbolic identification of Jews with money, even though modern finance has long replaced the peculiar roles of Jewish merchants in previous periods. But just as the nature of money has changed in the course of becoming capital, so is the content of modern anti-Semitism different from its historical antecedents. What stands, out about, what stands out about them both is the way they are made into materialized appearances of the abstract dimension of capital, its fetish form. And anti-Semitic hatred thus acquires a very particular political function in modern national societies. It appears to be anti-capitalism, and thus a form of popular revolt against the corrupting power of capital and money. However much this is falsely so, anti-Semitism has pseudo-emancipatory attractions and is thus especially dangerous, as well as very recurrent. That's all Bastot. For Bastot, in short, the Jew of anti-Semitism is a symbol of the fetish form of capital. I find this argument deeply compelling because it's able to hold in thought at once the specificity of anti-Semitic discourse and a connection nonetheless to the general structure of capitalism which explains why it is widespread and so toxic. But what is it that we can take from this then and retool to the purposes of understanding any other kind of racism, especially the anti-black racism that concerns us here? There would obviously seem to be a difficulty in doing so. The stone is very clear that he's not providing an argument about racism in general. He's interested precisely in the peculiar features of modern anti-Semitism the ways it departs from other kinds of prejudice or communal hatred. He does not think that a general account of racism can explain this to us. And I think he's right. My argument is not to suggest that anti-black racism functions just like anti-Semitism. What I want to suggest is in fact the opposite. Anti-black racism is not in some way the twin or the mirror image of anti-Semitism. It is rather, to return in another way to the metaphor of money, the other or the opposite side of the coin. They form not a unit, but a dialectical pair. Once again, I'm inspired here by Fanon. In Black Skin, White Masks, Fanon is keenly attuned to the co-appearance in France of anti-Semitism and anti-black racism. He tells us of an older African mentor in Paris who cautions him that whenever the French talk hatefully about Jews, they're talking about him. And he would obviously have read and largely agreed with Césaire's account of Nazi genocide as a continuation of forms of violence that developed in the colonial world. But in one key passage, he also pushes his argument about this co-appearance further and notes that there are in fact important differences between the two kinds of hatred. In modern racism, both the Jew and the black inspire fear and therefore violence he tells us, but they do so very differently. The fear of the Jew is the fear of a people engaged in conspiracy. What is dangerous is the capacity of Jewish people to exercise an invisible intelligence. The violence that calls forth is therefore a violence which aims to destroy an entire people, as people, as a people. Something different, he says, is happening in anti-black racism. Blacks are feared not for invisible intelligence, but in their visible bodies. They are hated not as a people, but as concrete bodily beings. Unlike Jews, they do not control. To the contrary, they are the opposite of control, an uncontrolled biology. And the characteristic violence that this calls forth, according to Fanon, 
is a punitive destruction of bodily life. The way he puts it, this is the structure of the Holocaust versus the structure of a lynching. Fanon does not explore the issue beyond this, but I think it is very clear from what he writes that he is interested in the way that anti-Semitic and anti-black racism together form a strongly polarized pair. So strongly polarized, I would add, that this cannot be accidental. They are not simply coincidental forms of hate. They are, in fact, dialectical opposites, and thus of a single system. That system, I want to argue, is the very same system of fetishized capitalism that Postone brings to bear his work on anti-Semitism. In Postone's account, the Jew of anti-Semitism is the body of money, which in turn is the material form of one side to the relationship of capital, the abstraction of wealth as value. That is where he leaves it. But capital, as Pistone himself reminds us so very clearly in all of his other work, is always a dialectical relationship. It is never a one-dimensional thing, whether abstract or not. Most importantly, in Marxist terms, the other side to capital is labor. Wealth is created in many ways, through labor or not, by machines or not. But it is only through the expenditure of labor as time that wealth accrues as value. If capital and labor are a dialectical pair, and if capital appears in fetish form as an abstract entity, then logically there must be a corresponding fetish form for labor. And I would argue that this fetish form is the biological body. The biological body is the opposite of money. It's the other side of money's coin. Both are possessed of power, but when money's power is clever, the force of the laboring body is brute. When money works to commensurate and dissolve the world of appearances, the biological body is possessed of an intractable concreteness. Money is a power of control. The biological body is a power which requires being controlled. And this is what labor appears as in its fetish form, not in relation to capital, but labor in itself. It will be clear by now where I'm going. If the Jew of anti-Semitism is the human body of money, the black of anti-black racism is the human representative of that biological body. Phenomenal. And the fetishized separation of labor from capital is the ground for the existence of both of the fetish forms which these human types represent. Just as with anti-Semitism, there is a pre-capitalist history to the stereotypes that offer the figure of blackness up to this role. This pre-capitalist history has especially to do with the phenomena of slavery and forced labor, which both in the New World and in the colonies generated a very widespread discourse on the brutishness of the recalcitrant black body, forced unwillingly into work. But in capitalist modernity, this register of stereotypes comes to stand for a one-sided representation of capital, as labor which is labor in itself, not labor under will. By way of concluding, an argument of this nature cannot be proven. It can only try to convince by fitting the facts with some plausibility. What I hope this argument does is to offer a plausible response to the problem with which I started. Why, amidst the maelstrom of capitalist development, the undoing and overturning of all identity, has race nonetheless been such a persistent and hardened feature of modern global society? It is not, and I want to insist on this, because racism has been used to constitute classes. That has happened. It's happened especially here in South Africa. But this cannot explain the recurrence and the persistence of anti-black racism across so many very different historical contexts where the intersection of race and class take many varying forms. What is much more general to capital is the relationship of race to the fetish forms of capitalist society. If the Jew of anti-Semitism is identified with capital in itself, apparently money, the black of anti-black racism is identified with labor in itself a brute biological force in need of mastery.
race and class might or might not be linked in particular historical contexts, race and capitalism are deeply linked. The critique of either one of them must also necessarily involve the critique of the other. Thank you. reshuffling of the decks doesn't, uh, doesn't change that basic structure. Capitalism in South Africa remains impossible without cheap black labor. Right? It's not where wealth is, it's where labor is. That's what defines a kind of capitalism. Um, but um, you know, the condition for the generation of value. Um, so, uh, so I think the fact that capitalism remains dependent on cheap black labor continues to define capitalism in South Africa as racial capitalism. So I think that that's correct. Um, this is a side note, I'm very unconvinced that uh, shuffling something like the, the distribution of land, while as much as it might be necessary, I doubt it will confront the basic relationships of capitalism. Um, that, it would, that would require something much more profound. I mean, that's, you know, even uh, the most modest uh, Congress programs back in the 50s or the 60s demanded the redistribution of property. They never demanded the abolition of property. And I think expropriation without compensation is not abolishing property, it's, it's redistributing it. Um, so there is a problem there. But I think that also the question I think for us is also um, why, uh, why race has such a very powerful hold on our imagination and particularly on our political imagination. And I don't think that that can be explained in terms of the historical particularity of the impoverishment of black people in South Africa. As true as that is, I think there's something more general going on in racism. That racism, anti-black racism, is more profoundly and deeply linked to, 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 cap, to, to the forms in which capital appears in global modernity than to particular historical trajectories where black people in particular have been dispossessed. 
So I think my argument is trying to get to a, 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 a way of thinking about race that doesn't depend upon true, but I don't think adequate accounts that would link it to questions like inequality, um, impoverishment, particular histories that have generated that. Thanks for a really interesting talk, and, and I think um, providing um, a really interesting kind of structural analysis around um, the possibilities of, of um, dialectical kind of possibilities of anti-black racism, and connecting that with anti-Semitism, and linking that with the, the kind of structured nature of capitalist production, and, and um, which I think is really interesting. But, but I, th I think the, one of my questions is. is Thinking about the politics of transformation, you know, what, what implications does it have for a politics of transformation? Is it, you know, can can we envisage, um, you know, a, a kind of powerful critique of of, uh, of anti-Semitism and, and anti-black um, racism? You know, can we can we envisage that in, in a context um, of living under capitalism? You know, and, and where where I mean, there's there's uh, it almost. That the talk seemed quite pessimistic in a way, in, in, in terms of wh wh where do we go? Is it, I mean, did we have to? Are you not pessimistic? Well, I, I mean, I, I, I guess I'm I guess very pessimistic. yeah, but, but I mean, I, I suppose you know, I'm interested in, in, in developing. Um, you're quite committed to ideas about transformation in universities, and 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 kind of well, what's the point? You know, and and and, and it's, it's sort of raises those kind of questions that this, this, I mean, it's really interesting, it's really powerful analysis, but at the same time, you know, where does it lead a politics of emancipation? What should we do? Yeah. <coughs> okay, yeah, <coughs> that, this is really, really interesting. Um, and you've taken it beyond the persona, and, and, and that's what I'm interested in. It seems that directly after the Second World War, amongst um, anti-colonial intellectuals, uh, the left, and so on, there was more of a possibility to articulate um, modern anti-Semitism with anti-black racism. And you, you mentioned uh, Césaire Fanon, but there's also uh, Albert, you mentioned, but also Du Bois, he writes immediately in, in 46 or 47, he's making the connection. So that that was in the air, if you like, but um, and then it becomes more difficult. There's a kind of separation, and I mean the Holocaust also gets re reconstructed as an exceptional space uh, that you know takes out the possibility of comparison, and it's problematic. But and others critique it, so it's seen. Um, and then of course you have Zionism and occupation in Palestine. And the whole range of ways in which it makes it difficult for that uh, post-colonial scholars to grapple with that that um, entanglement of, in, rel in relation to capitalism. So I find it interesting that you're bold enough to go in there, <laughs> and through Pistone, of course, where he doesn't. He says I'm specifically looking at modern anti-Semitism. So it's not so. You'd be pleased. It's not really a question. But you're welcome no, to the comment on that for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, do I, do I take those? And yeah. then take, my question came up. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Sorry to no. add here for you. Um, yeah, I was very struck by the thought that it's a pessimistic talk. Um, and I think um, my question, comment, if you like, is kind of a. I mean, my, so I, 
sad way the um, appropriateness of giving a Postonian talk this week. Um, as it's a sad loss for a critical theory um, this week. Um, um, but the thing that strikes me about kind of Moish Postone's version of critical theory is that it's extremely optimistic in the kind of libid in the kind of libidinal economy of theory. It's actually extremely an extremely optimistic theory. And I think the reason why it's an extremely optimistic theory is that it always finds what it wants to find. It always finds essentially the kind of deep structure of capital. And it relies really deeply on a kind of theoretical aesthetic that distinguishes particulars from, from universals or generals. Um, and it doesn't problematize that distinction in any at any point that I've ever seen in Postone, other than maybe kind of in one could perhaps give a very elaborate kind of reading that, of the way that these categories are actually used in the context in the progress of an analysis. But like just to kind of listen to the way that these terms are invoked, they're invoked as a kind of you know kind of absolute distinction. And one of the things that you can get from this distinction is that uh, no matter how many ethnographers, and that this is the role where I find myself kind of these of these postonian analysis, no matter how many ethnographers show up and say reality is immensely messy, um, reality is immensely multiple. Reality is constituted by many overlapping kinds of social formations, and the question of how they all assemble together is perhaps one that, and this is a, a thought that one can debate with, of course, um, the question of how they assemble together is one that maybe shouldn't be decided in advance of inquiry by kind of by a tradition of critical theory. Um, you see, I'm trying to make a, I'm trying, this isn't really a question, so you're, you're in luck. Um, <laughs> it's actually a speech about Buxton's project. Um, um, but, you know, the, so I guess the, if there were a question, maybe it is a comment in the end. Maybe there's a deep political pessimism because the type of revolution that it would take to overcome these incredibly abstract forms of abstraction is always difficult to make out. Meanwhile, it's immensely optimistic because you know you kind of get to be satisfied if you're a certain kind of theorist. And most most of the people who write this kind of theory are very male, and I think that this goes with the question about gender. Um, there, you kind of, there, you kind of always get to be satisfied in the process. Um, and so I think that, you know, to, to make this into a question, I will make this into a question. Um, what is the relationship between ethnography and this type of critical theory? Um, and, you know, I think one must think ethnographically about critical theory as well, and about the kind of desires that it tries to satisfy, and, and the politics that it manages to advance or potentially to impede. Um, so I guess this is a, a kind of question comment about optimism and, and gender and kind of the limits of generals and particular. Sure. So, um, well, no, in fact, let me bring together these two because they relate to each other so um, So my, my cheap answer is, is Gramsci, optimism of the will, pessimism of the intellect. This is the pessimism of the intellect part. I'm very optimistic of when it comes to the will, my own engagements with Kant's politics. imagine 
Um, and I think that in, in that context, one of the most important things we can do is to hold open the space for radical political thought, no matter what is being said in, in that space. Yeah, I think that that's, that's very important. Um, so, uh, you're obviously a great believer in the truth of the concrete. Um, I didn't say that, actually. Uh, yeah, but I would put it like that, because, uh, because actually, I'm going to capture you into my language. It's incorrect. Um, the concrete, as someone once said, is the concrete because it is the product of many determinations. Um, the way in which those many determinations uh, proceed uh, in capitalism is to create dialectical polarities. That's not a uh, trans-historical feature of reality. I'm not a dialectical materialist. I do think it's a very deep uh, structural feature of the development of capitalism, which constantly generates a reduction to polarity um, in, its, in, its, in, the, in the nature of its own dialectic. That's a very Pistorian argument. And that would be why uh, the world looks like the theory, uh, because the theory is seeking to capture a world in which that kind of reductive process is proceeding apace. Um, now, the only, as I said, this can't be proved. An argument like this can only uh, have plausibility. It can't have proof. This is why I call it optimistic. You know? Yes. It's because yeah. it, it's committed to the kind of indefinite poetic, its own kind of indefinite poetic. Well, it requires judgment. Uh, has this offered, has this argument offered uh, something previously unarticulated to our knowledge of the relationship between race and capitalism? Absolutely. If it's done so, it's, a, it's an effective argument. Uh, and its poetics are, of course, the means by which it got there. Yeah. Um, and so its effectiveness is not unrelated to that. Those poetics are not coincidental to it, I would say. They are necessary to it, um, and necessary to its capacity to produce that effectiveness. I do spend a lot of time writing ethnography, um, but I think that's, the task... That's why, that's why I asked. Yeah, I think the task which confronts us is not to uh, place truth in either the, the concrete or the abstract, because that's a false way of placing truth. Um, so that's why I'm certainly not a post-structuralist in that sense. I do not place truth in the concrete or in, in its messiness. Um, but nor do I place truth in, in the abstract. It's the mediation of these levels of reality uh, which helps us to, which is what we should try to represent in our writing. And this is an argument which operates at one level. In other writing, I would operate at other levels. But I certainly wouldn't um, apply different theory in those arguments. I think this is all consistent with that theoretical articulation. Um, it's the politics of writing, not the politics of politics. Um, I think that, uh, so one of Moshe's most compelling claims is that, um, and I said it in the talk, is that what's unique about anti-Semitism is that it's pseudo-emancipatory. Yeah. Um, anti-Semitism appears to be anti-capitalism. Yeah. Um, and I think that 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 has given it a dangerous attraction to many people who are concerned with programs of emancipation. Um, it is all too easy to make, I mean, even, even in South Africa where it seems preposterous at this point to identify white monopoly capital, if it, it's, if it exists as such, with Jewishness, still that's being done, uh, which is remarkable, right? There's a remarkable persistence of this. Um, and I think it has to do with that dangerous pseudo-emancipatory dimension to anti-Semitism, that precisely because the anti-Semitic representation of the Jew is a representation of the fetish form of capital, uh, hatred towards Jewish people appears to be hatred of the system yeah. um, and of the way it's controlled by uh, foreign agents, foreign forces. Um, so I think that that is a very dangerous thing. Um, and it requires critical theory to uh, to, um, in the absence of political conjunctures like the ones you're talking about, where there was a strong understanding of the relationship between anti-Semitism and anti-black racism, in the absence of that politics, it requires critical theory to remind us of that. Um, so uh, how to recover that politics is to me a very difficult question because most, um, most contemporary movements of emancipation are not uh, centrally anti-capitalist. And um, anti-capitalism would seem to be essential to the to the, the providing the context in which you can think through the relationship between these. Although, as I once say, I mean, I think you know the force of my argument is that anti-Semitism and anti-Black racism are not the same thing, right? But they a dialectical pair. Um, 
gender. So gender is also fundamentally about the body, and I've been talking about this a lot with someone I've been developing uh, a broader set of ideas around this with. Um, I think that, uh, in fact, our interest in the question of the body is itself a fetish process. Um, that our, our concern with the politics of the body, whether it be in race or gender or sexuality or any other dimension, our interest in that and the importance of the body to us, notice that the body, yeah, um, or bodies, we, we increasingly speak about bodies, um, the, 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 the fact that that has plausibility um, is, is itself interesting. Um, and I think it's, a, it's, at least in some ways, a mode of existence of precisely this process that I'm talking about. So I think that gender could in principle be brought under the same rubric. What is um, So the question would be whether misogynistic violence is as centrally related to the, the, um, the ideology of gender, defines the ideology of gender, as much as anti-black racist violence, violence perpetrated against the black body as a condition of including it in society, as that is central to blackness. Um, and I don't think it is. I think there's other stuff going on with gender that's perhaps, um, dare I say, more messy. <laughs> um, but, uh, um, but I certainly think that where, where this um, argument would uh, have a lot to say about theory of gender is uh, the very question of why the body uh, has become so important to us. Because of course gender has not always been about the body, no? um, and yet our politics of gender are very much now about that. More questions in the third round, second round of questions. One question that I was puzzling over, and it's, it's, it's more a comment that asks you to tease, out, to tease out one aspect of the argument, is around the non in the body. And, um, and I think I understand, I think I understand how you reconstruct it. But I'm curious about whether that allows for variations in blackness, variations in racism, whether the mediations of the appearance of blackness, uh, which seems sort of sub submerged here, whether, whether those play any role at all. In other words, um, the black and anti-black racism appears very clear, as if we know what it means almost across time, uh, certainly across, across, a, capitalist. across capitalist time. And I, and, and I wonder, in terms of the kind of concrete levels in which, in which racism and, and in which uh, forms of anti uh, anti black racism appear, whether things are much more messy. Do uh, does does uh, anti um, you know anti say Indian sentiments in, in, in various places, which may take similar forms, maybe around the body. Does can it be can it be pulled into this, or or, or do do those things remain outside? Um, exceptions to the category, or they, or they parts of the, parts of it. Yeah. So I'm going to answer that the same way I, would, I answered Eli. That um, the, in the kind of thinking I'm using here, uh, neither surface nor depth is more true than the other. The question is the way in which forms mediate across the sure. abstraction into the concrete. Um, the concrete is the concrete because it is the product of multiple determinations. Um, so yes, one would need to show how this uh, works out in particular historical contexts which would mediate its existence. Um, mediate its existence into particular forms uh, which would be different from each other. That would logically be implied in the theory. Yeah? Um, uh, what I don't think you can do is to um, jump from those different situations, or any one of them, to an account of what it is that's unfolding in all of them. That's what I'm trying to do here. So that's why I think that um, I'm impressed that, and I don't think it's surprising that uh, a South African concept had such legs. Racial capitalism was able to travel to the New World with Cedric Robinson and others, and produce a tremendous amount of thought. What's striking is that the notion that there's a deep relationship between racism and capitalism um, travels, but precisely across very different contexts. Now, so there's something there which would need to 
unfold into particular forms of existence, but cannot be identified with them. Um, and that would be why an argument at a certain level of abstraction would be necessary. You know, so as to account for what it is that is appearing in these different contexts. That in no way um, is incompatible with an insistence on the particularity of those contexts. Right. So what I find difficulty with messiness is that it's, it seems to be sort of uh, given a, 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 almost a sort of um, messiness is the good, the beautiful, and the true. Um, and abstraction is the bad, uh, it, it, it's almost like anti-Semitism, right? You know, there's concrete realities and then uh, there's, there's our abstract perversion of them in order to corrupt them to our theoretical purposes. Sorry, that was a, a low blow. <laughs> um, but, um, but there is something like that, right? This sort of um, the, the celebration of the concrete. Well, it's what Adorno called the jargon of authenticity. You know, there's nothing more true or authentic about the concrete than there is about the abstract. The point is the relationship between them. But I, I mean, I guess I still want to push you a little bit about the, the kind of overarching categories, anti-black and anti-Semitic. For instance, how do we account for the indigenous? Uh, is, is the indigenous, we had a talk in Brazil, mm -hmm. but is the indigenous folded into the black in a, in, where you, you know, typically, in the as in the case of you, you say, uh, in, you know, in a, a number of contexts I've read about, the indigenous is labeled as, as unwilling to work, mm -hmm. indigenous populations are labeled as unwilling to work, huge amounts of violence is exercised against them. Nevertheless, at, at, in, from certain political standpoints, in Brazil, for one, uh, there's a there's a real concrete difficulty with uh, you know, and a political difficulty with uh, with uh, for for Afro-Brazilian activists and for indigenous activists sharing common a common platform or recognizing their their forms of engagement with capital, etc., capitalism perhaps as as uh, or the state as as identical. In fact, that they feel marginalized in different ways. In, in very deeply different ways and not, and not sharing a, a common struggle. So I'm just, I'm wondering about whether the category anti-black is an er category, can, can, you know, the other side of the dialectic in, in some way. I mean, I'm compelled by it, but I'm just wondering how it, whether it co causes trouble and more than just um, concrete exception, right? Whether it, whether. This is where I'm going to be slow on my feet. I'm going to think about that for a long time. Um, but let me um, say a couple of things now. This actually won't be my final way on the, on, the, on the matter. I think that, um, well, the first thing to say is that uh, nothing is a theory of everything. Um, not even Marxism is a theory of everything. It's a theory of capitalist society, right? Um, and uh, so to describe a rich and complex world, you need a rich and complexly unfolded set of ideas. Um, and this is an attempt to take one slice um, and to point out something which I think cannot be pointed out through other ideas, uh, to identify a dynamic which cannot otherwise be accounted for. Identifying um, ideas which are adequate to that dynamic is not to claim that those ideas are now the only ideas that are adequate to anything. So I would just want to insist on that. Um, I think that uh, it's very interesting what you say about the um, the recalcitrance of indigenous labor as part of the colonial imagination. Uh, it's very interesting as to why um, in contexts where both, in new world contexts where both slave and indigenous labor were forced, um, only the one became racialized in the ways that we're familiar with um, in anti-black racism. Um, the indigenous uh, appears to have been much more susceptible to thinking through the idea of culture than the idea of race. Um, hence the anthropological obsession with it. Um, so why that would be the case is a very interesting problem. I wouldn't know how to begin to answer it, but I w I'm very confident, I'm optimistic, um, that uh, ideas related to this uh, might be able to, to, to make an intervention there. I mean, particularly when it comes to the question of culture, because I think of Andrew Sartori's uh, seminal work on um, the relationship between the emergence of the modern concept of culture uh, and, and the problematics of capitalism. Do we have some more questions or comments from the floor? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've got a basic question. <laughs> 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 
on capitalist societies. So, you know, how would you account for that? Would that fall under a totally different logic? Yes. Um, or yeah, it would have to. But why is it so persistent? Even there? You know, if, if, if well, what non capitalist societies are you talking about? Well, <laughs> the old USSR. It's not a non capitalist society, it's a form of state capitalism. I mean, the, the relationship between labor and capital is identical in the USSR to what it is in monopoly capitalism anywhere else. It's just the state owns the capital. It's not a dissolution of labor, proletarian labor. Um, so it's very much not a non-capitalist society. How can we even get outside of capitalism? Well, there's the $64,000 question, right? <laughs> so, so certain approaches didn't work. <laughs> Right, but I don't see. I mean, I don't see the connection between the the absence of an immediate answer to that question and the the, the impossibility of talking about uh, problematics of capitalism. That seems to me to be putting the cart before the horse. I mean, we certainly can't get out of it if we can't think about it. So I would insist on thinking about it a lot. <laughs> this, this this always seems to come up in relation to Marxism. It's sort of uh, there's this. Totalitarian thinker, you're you're um you're you're destroying all the messiness. You're gathering it all into your into your inflating value. It's very interesting. Do so we have any more questions or comments at this time? Yes. Yes. Hi. Um, yeah, I will try. I come from the European context, so I try to connect what you were saying with what we have in Europe now with the Muslim question. So maybe you can say a few words about that. How does the connect with secularism and racism? Yeah. Islamophobia um, yeah. is is uh, in desperate need of uh, critical theoretical analysis, um, and uh, I uh, I don't think that um, transposing the terms of this analysis to that would be in any way up to the job. It requires its own critical theoretical analysis which it would obviously, like the question of the indigenous, be in the same theoretical space, but it would be a very different yeah. unfolding. Um, I mean, there are ways in which Islamophobia combines dimensions both of anti-Semitism and of anti-black racism, but that's not how I would answer it, right? I'm just saying it's interesting that it does. So there's the international conspiracy um, of anti-Semitism, the sort of the hidden motives uh, which appear suddenly through, you know, um, uh, that is a lot like, and yet there's this notion in Islamophobia of uh, Muslim people as being irrationally violent mm -hmm. and uh, this is sort of essential violence that's very close to imagery from anti-black racism. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that these have been merged mm -hmm. um, and that we don't have anything like an adequate account of how, that's, how that form of hatred mm -hmm. has emerged. Yeah. But I would insist that it should be possible to provide them. What about secularism? Because that's something that uh, many authors view as a kind of yeah, additional explanation on I'm not convinced by that kind of argument. It's a lot like the argument that um, Neville Alexander makes about the that the, the, the place of mm -hmm. that the way in which um, race uh, facilitates the formation of classes through elite ideological manipulation. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> I'm not convinced by that kind of argument. It doesn't seem to me to account for the, 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 the spreading, the proliferation of something like Islamophobia across a very wide variety of contexts. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, 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 again, I, I don't have, I haven't thought that through, yeah. um, so I don't have a ready answer to it. It's obviously a very important question, but I, I, I'm skeptical of the idea that the Saba Mahmoud type account yeah. is actually going to be satisfactory. Mm -hmm. yeah. Although it's, it's very sad that she also has died recently. Mm -hmm. yeah. So on that note, I'd like to thank all of you for coming and thank Hilton for a very engaging, very serious sort of work to talk. And from next week we take a break and we, resu we resume on the 12th of April, I think, uh, with Anita Chari. Uh, there is a seminar, but it's not part of the series um, happening on next Thursday, right? Yes. Uh, and, and it's your paper. Yes. Uh, remind me of the title? So male circumcision debates in so Europe. On male yeah. circumcision debates in Europe. In Europe. Okay. So thank you. Uh, thanks a lot. Thank you.